Okay, when we ended our last class, we stopped with a probe that I ask you to think about, and that is how do you decide what channel you're going to watch when you turn on the TV set? What did you conclude since I last saw you? What do you turn on first, or usually? Um, I turn on the, uh, the channel where the news is at so I can figure out what the weather is the next day for class. Okay, news and weather are important to you. Okay, so you know what to wear, whether to take an umbrella. Okay, hold that thought. How many people are like that, news and weather people? And do you turn the weather channel on, or you just go for news and weather? Any weather channel folks? One, two, couple. Okay, yeah. Sometimes I go for the weather channel because I, I have relatives that live around the country and friends in different parts, and so I care whether they're having an earthquake in San Francisco or a flood in the Midwest or whatever. Okay, what else do you turn on and why? What do you watch? Sports Center. Sports Center, okay. You like sports. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's okay. That's a good answer. The people who sponsor that channel are grateful that you turn it on. Okay, who, who watches something else? I know in summer school you don't have much time to watch anything. But. I watch um, E! Entertainment. <laughs> okay. How many entertainment folks? Yeah. Okay, and how many watch a variety of channels? Sure, most, most of us do that. Um, so we don't always turn the same thing on. And we'll be looking at theories today that explain, you know, we said back at lecture one, that good theories should tell us, should explain things and predict what we'll do. And so we'll, we'll look at the specific theories that predict what we're going to do as we use the media. Okay, there's several viewpoints that we'll just kind of uh, look over in a nutshell here, and then we'll go back and examine some of the more important ones. we will go ahead and get all uh, six of these up so you can take whatever notes you need. Uh, one of the things we're going to see, though, is that media have more effect when there's something abnormal going on. They have a reinforcement uh, effect when things are normal, routine, there's no flood, there's no hurricane, uh, traditional times are present as the theorist puts it. And, and the media will have more influence on people when we're under high stress. We're in a war, we're in a major flood, there's a hurricane coming ashore at Galveston, etc. Okay, there's a little hypodermic needle model that says influence attempts of the mass media facilitate direct change. Now again, that ties back to the previous statement. That's only true, or it's most often true, I shouldn't say only, it's most often true when we're under stress. But if they say evacuate Galveston Island, do the people evacuate? Well, depends on how fast the wind is, how high the wind is, how high the waves are, what the location of the storm is, okay? You know, we underestimated the recent storm, Alicia, because one, we didn't have the warnings from the media, but also uh, it, it didn't have the same parameters and, and uh, indicators that frequently are the case. Okay, there's a little one-step flow theory that we'll come back to that says individual differences have to be taken into account. That while the hypodermic model, the hypodermic needle model says uh, there's, it's kind of like inoculation theory. Remember that when we had persuasion that you can be inoculated against things? Well, the hypodermic injection is the sort of thing that uh, when the media tells us a school is closed or all of HISD is closed, you know, that's a very direct, massive effect that results from that one injection. But nevertheless, not everybody gets that message. 
right, for some whatever reason, some people are still in bed asleep, some just weren't paying attention, some don't maybe don't have a TV or a radio, not very many of those. But anyway, there are people then, or, and some folks just see it first. So the opinion leaders are the ones who relay that information to other folks. And when we come to diffusion theory, we'll look at that even more closely. But just kind of an overview right now, uh, we're noting that uh, there's that direct effect from the hypodermic model notion. But then those people then, uh, remember our, our discussion of the grapevine somewhere, <laughs> I think we talked about somewhere this semester, probably under organizational, but that, you know, she tells her friends, and she tells her friends, and he tells his friends, and things move in clusters, and that's the way it works with the opinion leaders. Did you see on the news where, and whether it's a celebrity who's recently passed away, or a school closing, or a weather bulletin, uh, whatever. Okay, so we'll see more of that. Uh, social categories ties back into that social identity theory that we had under groups, uh, but the, uh, it, it notes that the media looks at people by categories. Remember when we, we uh, looked at the brief history of mass communication and noted that uh, the global village of Marshall McLuhan, and we'll get him later today, that cable television has broken people into these categories. We have these little cultural islands, as it were, and there may be the people who watch, you know, my son-in-law pretty well stays on the sports channel all day, when he's not working, of course, you know, because he loves basketball especially, but he loves all sports, and so he stays on there, and that's his channel of choice. And so forth. But somebody else, I have a friend, I may have mentioned her before, who loves the Weather Channel. I like it, but I don't love it. Uh, but, but she likes the music, she likes the background, she likes the little featurettes on there, whatever. And it doesn't even matter why. But that's, that's her choice. These choices weren't possible a couple of decades ago. Before we had cable television, before we had this social categorization and, and people grouping themselves by these different group identities, you know, you couldn't put your kid in front of your child, pardon me, in front of the Cartoon Network, and I wish you wouldn't now, but you know, uh, you didn't have the option of placing them there all day. Cartoons only came on for a certain segment of the day, but now you can cook virtually all day. You can spend most of your day with Martha Stewart or, you know, or you could shop and, and you just have a lot more options than before. Okay, the social relations model is similar to that opinion leader thing. It's just recognizing that there are multi-steps in this flow of information and we'll see more of that as we go on. Okay, we're going to look at reinforcement theory a little more specifically now and recognize that first of all this theory says that persuasive attempts in the mass media tend to reinforce existing attitudes. Okay, On the whole it'll just reinforce the way things are. Democracy is good, being a responsible citizen is good, looking out for your neighbor is good, cleaning up your litter is good. Can you think of other ideas that are reinforced? Donate blood. Attending class. Go to class. Yeah, that's a good thing. I, I wish they run that on TV more. Students, get out of bed. <laughs> okay. Uh, change can occur, but as we were saying a minute ago, it's usually accompanied by conflict, by stress, or by high persuasibility. Uh, remember we talked about how some people, not necessarily females, but how some people are more highly persuasible than others. And we have that notion of general persuasibility. Okay, well those people who have high persuasibility will be more influenced by the media. They may hear, you know, great, you know, we're coming up on the 4th of July with this taping. And 
uh, there are all these sales going on, you know, and, and it would sound like it's, it's the only sale that will ever be, uh, or no sale will ever be as fine as the sales that are coming up over this holiday weekend. And highly persuasible people are likely to believe that and, and get that feeling of I'd better go out and buy it now because this is my big opportunity and if I miss it, She's shaking her head over here. You know, if I miss it, what am I going to do? Well, you know what? What do you? When, when will the next big sale of your life? What did you say? Labor Day. Labor Day. Yeah, and you know, and Memorial Day. Then there'll be some, there'll be a President's Day in between, and an end of the year clearance, and on and on it goes. Okay. Uh, the stress ties back into what we studied, which seems long ago now, even though we've only been together a few weeks, uh, what we studied about cognitive dissonance. Remember when two cognitive elements are in conflict with each other? We, we work to reduce that stress. Well, the same thing is happening with the media. It's just happening on a larger scale with masses of people instead of one person dealing with their own internal stress or two people, one stressing the other in order to uh, produce something. But those cognitive elements are in discrepancy. And so we, when that happens, then, then we work and we're more persuaded and, and we respond more. Okay, the mass effects are influenced by the media, by the message, and by the situation. It depends on what the situation is, what message you are getting, and what you're being told uh, to do. And there may even be some channels or news commentators that you believe more than others. I don't know, we won't get into that here. But, but most of us have our favorite commentators. We have our stations that we think re report just a little more reliably, perhaps, than someone else. Uh, but anyway, the media itself is this radio, and when we get to McLuhan, we'll look at different media effects, r the effect of radio, the effect of television, and how those are alike in different print journalism. And for some people, it makes a difference which media form they're exposed to, as well as who's saying it and what the situation is. Okay, uses and gratification theory is one that helps explain why your answers were different earlier when, when we ask what channel you watch the most. Okay, this focuses on the consumer. Okay, the focus is on you as the consumer. And it says and recognizes that you're active, that as a viewer you have a choice about what you watch when you turn on the TV. And that you're going, or the radio, or, or which section of the newspaper you turn to first. When you read a newspaper, which section do you turn to first? How many go to the cartoons first? Okay, you're the mentally healthy ones out there. <laughs> there, was, there was some little report on that, but I can't remember which pop psychologist was telling that. But, you know, go for the cartoons first. Okay, but as viewers, you are active, you make choices, and you correlate that with your individual needs. So if you need the business report, if you need the weather report, if you need traffic, if you want to check your horoscope, whatever it is that you do. But as viewers, we use the media in order to gratify or satisfy our needs. And so that makes it very important from the media's point of view to try to produce those things that people want to see and read and hear. Seeing and reading are close. Okay, so, so whether it's sports or whether it's entertainment, entertainment, I mean, look at the boom in the MTV videos. You know, though, of course, those weren't even an option not long ago. Uh, but if people weren't interested in those, if people didn't want to look at that, then the channel wouldn't make it. You know, if the sports buffs weren't all watching what's on there. So anyway, uses and gratification theory says that 
uh, we use the media in order to meet certain needs that we have and that the media is in fact capable of satisfying those needs but it competes with other sources for satisfaction because it can only gratify some needs. What are some needs that you have that the media can't meet? That would be the interpersonal needs. Okay, your interpersonal needs, although you may fall in love with certain characters on there and really identify, yes, <laughs> you know. Uh, you, you may be fond of certain people and, and feel that identification with them. Remember the word for that? Missed good. Okay, from Kenneth Burke. Mystification. Yeah. Okay, let's be more specific. Uh, what kind of interpersonal and personal needs do you have that the TV or the radio can't meet? Touching. Touching. Good. Can you eat that wonderful gourmet meal that you're looking at? Nope. If you're hungry, the radio or the TV is not the place to go. Let's hear it for the refrigerator <laughs> or the stove or the fast food place closest to you. Okay, see, and, and so whether you need a good hug from a live body, you know, there was, I don't have the whole story in my head, but there was some little kid who, maybe this was a Sunday school class story, who the teacher was talking about how much God loved the children. And the little guy looked up and said, Well, that's okay, teacher, but, but I need some skin. <laughs> or, you know, I, I need a, a body with, with skin. The reference was to skin. The story fell apart. Sorry, folks. But anyway, <laughs> wanted somebody that could actually touch and hug. It didn't matter how much, sorry about that, but anyway, it didn't matter how much you're loved if, if you weren't capable of getting kissed and touched and hugged and so on. Okay, that one's bad. Anyway, the media only gratifies some needs, and we'll leave that at that. Okay, the next theory that we have up is, depend, is the dependency model, and this is kind of a first cousin to uses and gratification. And it points out that the audience depends on the media information then to meet the needs and attain goals. We use it because it gratifies us, but if we do that often enough, we actually get dependent. Okay? We, for me, I teach a night class up near Greens Point Mall a couple of times a week. And so it's really important for me to check the traffic as I'm getting ready to drive up there or any other time I'm going out, but, but that is particularly relevant. And so I'll turn on the talk station that I rely on to give me regular traffic reports so I know where the most recent overturned 18-wheeler is, and because there's going to be one. You know that. I mean, how, how many days a week do we not have an 18-wheeler tying up something around here? So, uh, But it's also important for me, I check it in the mornings too coming in, because I need to know if the manure truck or whatever has dumped, was that what turned over on 59 that time? Something really disgusting that tied traffic up for hours. Years ago, we had the ammonia tank truck explosion over on 59. But see, I live close enough that, that unless I'm venturing out for a particular reason, I don't have to deal with that. But I want to know if my students are telling me the truth when they say, oh, 59 was tied up for three hours this morning because elephants were walking around on the freeway. <laughs> well, you know, that could have. I think they caused a traffic jam over your compact center one year. I can't remember exactly what they did. But, you know, oh, I want to know if those things are true. I want to know if part of the city's underwater, the other part isn't, that kind of thing. Okay, the dependency model assumes a three-way interaction between media, audiences, and society. You know, it's just recognizing that, that you're the audience, but you're part of society, and there's that three-way interlinkage there. Okay, some key variables are the number of information functions as well as the centrality of that information. And tied to that is the structural stability 
of society. If we're in a terrorist attack and everything's falling apart, well, you know, all bets are off and, and it's a whole uh, different ball game in that situation. But under normal times, then we're going to be most dependent depending on what kind of information we need, whether it's sports scores, weather information, traffic, just the latest news events, uh, cultural activities going on in the area. Maybe you want free tickets to something and you're listening to your favorite uh, stations trying to you know, be the right caller to call in and get something. It depends on what you need. But the, the more you use something for a particular means, and, and the odds are uh, some of you are radio people, maybe because you're in your car a lot, or you like the radio playing at home while you're doing other things. Uh, some of you are television folks <clears throat> because you want the sound and the visual together. Other people are, are very much newspaper dependent. You know, they get that newspaper morning or evening, but they sit down and systematically go through it and read a great deal. Some read it almost cover to cover. That takes a while. Uh, you know, but it, it depends on what you need and how, so that how, how you use the media in order to gratify or satisfy those needs, but then you become dependent on it and, and you start to get your news predominantly one way rather than another. And so that's where this dependency notion comes in. Okay, there are several kinds of effects that can occur once you become dependent. Okay, and even as you use, but especially the effects are more likely uh, to occur once you're actually becoming dependent on a particular medium. There can be cognitive changes, affective or emotional changes, and behavioral changes or in order to get a behavioral change you you would have to have either someone who agreed with you or you'd have to have the emotional and cognitive change to go along with it cognitive change means that there's a change in your mind about the way you think about something there may be what's called ambiguity resolution things are just clearer now, you thought tarantulas were poisonous and you discovered they aren't. So maybe now you'll pick up your friend's pet tarantula. I'm still not there. But at least I don't believe it's going to bite me and kill me anymore. You know, creepy crawly things, I don't know. Okay, attitude formation. Maybe you simply never had an opinion about something before, whether it's animals or countries or politics or whatever the issue may be. And so the attitude formation may develop as a result of watching a particular program. Okay, History Channel, Discovery, all those kinds of things that help you learn uh, different things. Okay, agenda setting, we're going to come back to that term uh, later on, but just briefly it's, it's the media telling us what's important. Uh, the death of celebrities, an earthquake in Peru, whatever those stories are that are up at the top of the list. It's like your order of business for the day in a meeting. And so the agenda gets set and that helps you know what's important. And that'll be a cognitive thing for you. You know, your brain's going, oh, I didn't know that happened. Oh, let me pay attention to this. Okay, we may also expand our belief system, things that we believe about what goes on under the ocean, uh, things that we believe about our own society, or just, uh, you know, you're, we've already talked about beliefs in and about when we talked about Rokich and we talked about instrumental and terminal beliefs. And we said that your centrally held beliefs are what we refer to as values. Those things that are important to you are the things you believe in that are important, that those are of value to you. There are lots of things you believe that, you know, you believe there are desks and classrooms across campus. Yeah, okay, you know, 
you believe they're holding classes over at UT and A&M today? Okay, you know, but those are not centrally held, and so for, unless you know something, I don't know, uh, those are not of high value to you at this particular point in time. <clears throat> okay, another thing that happens, a type of effect that occurs is this affective component. We develop feelings and we have emotional responses to things. What's something you've had an emotional response to lately? Loss of life during the flood. Okay, loss of life and property during the flood. You know, anybody with any kind of a heart sat there going, oh man, look, you know, this is terrible. Look at that. This is even worse. You know, and, and we hurt with those people. And then, then what happened? Well, some, for some people, nothing happened. They just kept sitting on their sofa going, oh man, this is terrible. You know, and they really meant it. But then for others, there was, number three, a behavioral response. Maybe people who've never volunteered before at a shelter or a food, uh, a Red Cross shelter or, you know, any of those sites got up and did something. Actually went over and helped pass out food, pass out blankets, carry babies, cook food. Uh, you know, there, I'm sure there were hundreds if not thousands of people during that incident who did things that they'd never done before. Now, why did they do that? As far as the media goes. I mean, they did it to be helpful. They did it to be nice. Who told them to do it? The media. Yeah, they said, we need help out here. I mean, they may have interviewed people who said, I need help. But indirectly, it was because of the media. Otherwise, uh, many of us would have just sat home thinking, boy, we're having a really bad rain this weekend. You know, I hope my house doesn't flood. Or, oh darn, my garage is getting flooded. You know, but particularly people on the southwest side of the city, unless they were watching, you know, a, lo a lot of folks slept in on Saturday and were hours late catching up on this. Uh, but anyway, they, they didn't have the same initial level of response that other people did. So anyway, the media is very important because it can cause cognitive changes, emotional changes, behavioral changes. And we know from our unit on persuasion that those are interlinked. Okay. And the messages affect us to the degree that we depend on the media. Okay. If you don't depend, you know, you don't turn the media on, then it's not going to impact you. And that, that ties us back to what, remember the research unit we were discussing about violence and aggression and whether or not uh, too much electronic stimulation from PlayStations to TV uh, contributes to ADD and so forth. And, and some of the research is not clear. You know, there, there's a suggestion of this or a, a tendency toward that, but it's not cut and dried like smoking causes cancer. You know, it's not that clear a correlation. Uh, but if we're dependent on these things, then there's a high probability of this influence. Okay, we're going to shift a little bit to the structural functional model of Charles Wright.